me if I would share a few words this evening, <clears throat> offer a few words of reflection on, on the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha. And uh, I was very happy to accept the invitation. here, the end of um, quite a full and beautiful day. Um, monks and nuns, we had our oppositor uh, meetings this morning, a chance to reflect on our, the uh, rules, the discipline that we've undertaken, and to uh, refresh our commitment to living in this way. And then this afternoon, the ceremony for Sister Garawa and Sister Sobita, who've now become Siladara, part of the Siladara Sangha, part of the community of nuns living, practicing together here in this monastery. Uh, a very beautiful occasion uh, that many of us who are here had a chance to uh, participate in uh, a sense of celebration, a sense of gladness. Mm. Mm. Reflecting on a verse in the Dhammapada, <clears throat> which I think is often quoted in connection with uh, people entering uh, monastic training, going forth. Something like, um, those who once were heedless and now are no longer heedless uh, brighten, illuminate the world uh, like the moon freed from clouds. Uh, and I find this a very, very lovely image, a lovely uh, contemplation. And I thought this evening perhaps to talk a little bit about um, some of the clouds. <laughs> uh, that uh, this mindfulness can uh, free us from. Uh, of course, the saying does not just apply to people becoming nuns or monks. It uh, refers to anybody who suddenly wakes up to the, the truth. Even just having a little glimmer of the truth uh, can transform our lives uh, in unimaginable ways. And uh, my sense is that at this time, uh, particularly the world is really crying out for this kind of illumination. Uh, there seems to be so many impossible situations, so much confusion, so much fear, so much violence. Um, 
and such a lack of any kind of sense of uh, the potential beauty of life and the sense of our shared humanity. Um, how deeply we seem to be sunk into our different identities uh, and these identities keep us bound into patterns of conflict and violence um, the sense of total lack of any kind of um, restraint you know, if you want something, you just go and get it, regardless of the cost, the harm that's done to others. And, um, you know, we can feel enraged, upset, um, angry, helpless, confused, and all absolutely understandable reactions. And when we begin to look into our own hearts, sometimes, well, certainly I found, uh, the capacity in some way to understand how these things happen. Uh, when we're confused, uh, when we're confused about um, our real identity, when we're confused about what really brings peace and happiness, uh, we can uh, reach out in all the wrong directions for uh, gratification. <laughs> and my sense is that this is something that human beings do, all of us, I think, and perhaps it's the beginning to realize this that has brought us all to to be here this evening, a sense of Yes, I'm. I'm confused. There's, there's fear. There's, there's the potential for all kinds of harm, and I, I want to find a way to, to live differently. And uh, personally, I'm. I'll always, always be grateful uh, to have come across these teachings, this way of practice, um, because there were things in my life that were confusing, impossible are apparently impossible and uh, the teachings of the Buddha you know, gave a, a hint of to how to, as to how to um, understand these things and transform them so it's not a small thing that uh, has brought us here uh, and not a small thing that has brought each one of the nuns each one of the monks to uh, enter into this training, this way of practice. And I was thinking about these things earlier, and <laughs> uh, thinking back to my my youth <laughs> uh, and how um, when I was uh, my late teens, early twenties, how it, ordinary it was for people to smoke cigarettes and how we you know, became addicted to these these things and how in those days, I think this is sort of sense that they weren't terribly good for you but um, you know, people used to do it everywhere uh, you know, cinemas, people would be smoking cigarettes, and particularly when the movie got kind of violent or tense, everyone would have a cigarette, and the whole cinema would be filled with these clouds of smoke, and whether you smoked or not, you would inhale this stuff. Aeroplanes, trains, restaurants, people would eat and smoke cigarettes at the same time. And somehow or other, it was quite normal to be have this this kind of smoke um, that we were all kind of taking in you know, just not not having any clue that it was actually harming us and you know, polluting um, our lungs you know our very bodies would be polluted with this stuff this smoke 
and it was normal. And um, I was realizing that this was actually quite a, a useful simile uh, for some of the um, unskillful habits of thinking that we can uh, get into. Um, not realizing that they're in any way harmful. Not realizing that there's anything we can do about them. I mean, with the cigarettes, fortunately, the government decided to do something <laughs> and uh, made it and uh, uh, you know, made an effort to create cleaner atmospheres for people to you know, watch movies in, cleaner atmospheres for people to eat in, to travel in. Um, obviously it was difficult for those who were addicted and people who are still addicted. It's, it's um, uh, much more difficult to find a place where you can smoke cigarettes without uh, causing problems. But um, you know, for those who don't smoke cigarettes, there is a, a possibility to live in a cleaner atmosphere. But I think it's important for us to consider just the ways that we pollute um, our minds with um, uh, unhelpful habits of thought. which quite naturally um, often overflow into unhelpful unha habits of, of speaking. All based on um, an unhelpful habit of how we see ourselves and how we see each other. So this way of life, uh, this practice, uh, is an attempt to, or it creates a situation within which we can begin to become aware of these um, if we're clever, if we're willing. Um, you know, some people think that they're going to, uh, maybe from the outside, it, you, know, you might think, well, I'm going to uh, go to the monastery and live with all those lovely monks and nuns who are always so calm and peaceful and always get along so well together <laughs> and uh, love each other and cooperate all the time. And um, sometimes they're a bit surprised to hear that you know, that's not always the case. You know, that, uh, there can be disagreements, different uh, ways of seeing things uh, that we don't always get along. And um, I remember being uh, quite overwhelmed really with sense of negativity uh, towards my fellow sisters. This was in the very early days at Chithurst. I remember there were just four of us to start with, and I remember just sitting in a room with with them and with the rest of the sangha, monks and nuns and the guests, everybody, and just sitting there just thinking, there's really not enough space in this room for us, the four of us. <laughs> Feeling of just not enough space for us. <clears throat> and there's not enough space <clears throat> in this room, not enough space in this monastery and really doubting whether there was actually enough space in the universe for us all. Um, this feeling of um, uh, needing to, needing to uh, not wanting to be with them, sense of aversion, negativity. And that was just one of the feelings that arose. Um, it wasn't a continuous state, but it was um, an interesting one to notice in a way, uh, the monastic life is designed to enable 
us to see these things, to see our aversion, our negativity, our views of ourselves, our views of each other, uh, the ones we like, the ones we don't like, the ones that we're critical of, the ones that we judge and we blame, um, the ones that we're fascinated by, interested in, attracted to. Different things can happen in response to these um, thoughts, these feelings that arise. You know, we might blame ourselves. You think I shouldn't. I shouldn't think. I shouldn't have those thoughts. You know, I, I should. I shouldn't dislike people. I shouldn't be irritated by people. I shouldn't be jealous of people. That's a very strong. I really shouldn't be jealous. I shouldn't. I shouldn't mind. I remember I had a big thing about minding. <laughs> I never. I never wanted to mind. I wanted to be easygoing. Um, you know, joyful, cooperative and certainly didn't want to mind about anything and yet often I did mind <laughs> and uh, you know sometimes I would do my best to to not mind and to cover up this minding but sometimes I really really minded a lot about different things if somebody got something that I wanted or if somebody was praised and I wasn't praised or um, Somebody came who I didn't really want to have in the community, or yeah, different things I would mind about. Um, and then I would mind because I minded. <laughs> I didn't think I should mind. I didn't want to mind. I wanted to be easygoing, adaptable, flexible. Didn't want to mind. And uh, I spent many years struggling with different uh, states, you know, minding different things, um, feeling concerned about my practice, feeling like a hopeless case, never be any good, all kinds of ideas, views uh, that would arise. And it's funny how we can get stuck into a struggle with these things. Get into a struggle with our aversion, our negativity. Get in a struggle with our desires. Get into a struggle with our sense of competitiveness or um, all the different things that arise in community in relation to one another. Uh, we do that. Thinking that the practice is about not minding, that the practice is about being calm and peaceful, making the mind calm and peaceful, being bright and alert and positive. Not realizing that the practice is actually about mindfulness not about making ourselves into a perfect nun or monk or lay person not about doing the right thing getting you know getting it right practice is about mindfulness so what's this mindfulness <laughs> what does this mean what does it mean in terms of our daily life? What does it mean in terms of our interactions, our living together? What does it mean about how we are in meetings, discussions, uh, about working together, doing the washing up, cooking, the chores, pujas, 
meditation. What does it mean? What's this mindfulness? It means about noticing what's going on. Noticing if there's a struggle and being interested in that, being curious about that. Not thinking there's anything wrong with struggling, not thinking there's anything wrong with anything, <laughs> but being curious about it. Curious about the wanting things to be otherwise, wanting ourselves to be otherwise, wanting that person to be otherwise. That person, she should be otherwise. She's not the way they sh she should be. She shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have to go through this. I shouldn't have to experience this. It shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't have to do this. Uh, the complaining mind, the judging mind, the critical mind. Not blaming or judging or being critical of the blaming, judging, critical mind, but being curious about it. What's going on here? Uh, what, am I af what am I afraid of? What do I want? I always wanted to be okay. Quite wanted to look good, actually, to get it right. I wanted my meditation to be good, to be peaceful. Certainly didn't want to fall asleep, which is what I did the whole time, because I was struggling so hard. <laughs> I used a lot of energy struggling and then falling asleep. So I'm in a kind of cloud of aversion, negativity, struggle. These clouds, smoky clouds that get into the mind, the habits of thinking, the patterns of thinking, that cloud the mind, that confuse us, don't see clearly. So we need to find ways to be curious, to be interested, not to be afraid looking at the, the struggle. We're learning about the human condition, aren't we? What it is to be a human being. The Buddha taught us that there is suffering in this human realm. You know, life, is, life is not easy. There is suffering, there are struggles, there are difficulties. There's old age, sickness and death, is the obvious um, things that uh, cause us pain and uh, that we would rather not have. There are these which are uh, to be contemplated. And there are also the kind of, uh, maybe you could call them the smaller struggles, uh, wanting to succeed, wanting to look good, uh, wanting to get things the way that we want them to be. These other kinds of struggles, not wanting to fail, not wanting to experience humiliation, wanting praise, Success, happiness. But this first noble truth that life as a human being is difficult requires that we understand the suffering that we experience, that we understand the struggle not that we get rid of it, but that we understand it. When we understand it, then that gives us the key to uh, transforming it. The key to letting go.
letting go of our fixed views of ourselves, how we should be, how we must be, how we are, what we've got to do to get to the way that we think we should be, the perfect monk, the perfect nun, the perfect practitioner. (laughs) But when we really contemplate our lives, we see that we're not really quite as fixed and solid as we might have imagined previously. That actually we're a continuous flowing, a continuous process of flux and change. Uh, Sometimes the changes are dramatic, sudden. We have a sudden insight, sudden understanding. Uh, Sometimes they're much subtler, they just happen gradually. Just gradually begin to see things differently, gradually begin to appreciate the ways that we make life difficult for ourselves. The ways that we create misery. I was very interested many years ago, some of you have probably heard me talk about this before, how I was, I think, when I was living at Chithurst, I think, maybe with Ajahn Sujita, he talks a lot about self-disparagement, um, or at least he did at that time. And I realized that this was a very strong habit. There's a lot of negativity towards this being here. It was never, never good enough. Never did things quite right enough. <laughs> uh, there was always something wrong. And you know, even if I did something good, there would be something that wasn't quite good enough. Just like, in fact, Dungeon Samaji used to talk about it as well. Just like having a, a kind of really unkind parrot sitting on our shoulder, constantly whispering, you're no good, you'll never be any good. That wasn't very good. You should have done that differently. They're constantly nagging at us. And um, I decided just for an experiment to uh, give up self-disparagement. I don't know if it was New Year or if it was Vassar or some particular time when one takes on these aditanas, these resolutions, but uh, I decided to have a go at it. And uh, it was very, very illuminating. Firstly, what was illuminating was how prevalent it was, how it, how big a part of my life it was, how it was a constant companion. Uh, and the second thing that was illuminating was as I began to stop doing it, you know, I realized I could stop doing it. I realized it was a habit, a habitual response to a particular set of circumstances. And, you know, with any habit, we can, tra- we can change it. We, we're, not, we're not stuck in it. We can change it. You know, once we see what's needed. And once I, once I began to work with it, little by little, uh, just stopping doing it, you know, when, you know, when it started, when this voice started, I just stopped it. I said, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. Or sometimes I would replace it with another, another thought. You know, if it was, you're no good, you'll never be any good. That was very good, Chandasiri. You did that really well. <laughs> um, what I noticed was that I felt much lighter, much happier. It was quite remarkable. And then I reflected on the Buddha's um, simile that he used for ill will, which is one of the five hindrances. And he said it's, it, it's like a sickness. It's like an illness. It makes you feel rotten, horrible. So I contemplate this in my own life, and sometimes the ill will is directed 
and it, it used to be a lot directed towards this one. I don't actually do it so much now because I've decided not to. <laughs> um, but I can still be critical of other people sometimes, get stuck into a, you know, they shouldn't do that, she shouldn't do that, he shouldn't do that, whatever. And there is a kind of wonderful feeling about being right about something. Yeah, there's this problem, this thing is wrong, and this is what's wrong, and this is what needs to happen, and um, they should do something about it, this has to change. You, know, you can have a build up a, a big story, um, and you can talk to other people about it. Um, this kind of righteous indignation thing that can happen. You know, it's their fault, it's wrong. And, uh, you know, you can feel quite good about it in some ways. You've got a cause, a reason. Um, and it doesn't just happen in monasteries. Um, it happens everywhere. <laughs> um, I don't watch, hardly ever watch TV, I, I'm happy to say, um, but I do have a little, little iPad and sometimes I look at the BBC news, partly because I feel a sense of, uh, it feels that as a senior nun, I really should know a little bit about what's happening in the world. Because you know, people come and talk to me about things and it feels actually really, Im and particularly living in Scotland where I do, in, in the hermitage at Milne Tume, it feels important to be a little bit aware of the kind of things that people are dealing with in their lives and the kind of concerns, you know, about about the environment is obviously a, a huge concern. Um, about the um, situation in, in Ukraine, a huge concern and um, about the situation with the government, Partygate, <laughs> all of that. And just noticing how the way that things are presented is almost designed to make you feel a certain way about things and to get indignant. And um, I contemplate this and I contemplate the effect that it has uh, if I buy into it in that way. Um, you know, if I, if I, if I allow this kind of criticism and negativity to invade my heart. It gives a kind of energy, righteous indignation, but it also doesn't make me feel good. It's like, you can just say, Ugh, I don't want to have to, I don't like, I don't want to have to um, carry these uh, negative ways of thinking. I don't need to. You know, in the old days when we went to the cinema, you had to inhale the cigarette smoke whether you smoked or not, because that was what was in the atmosphere. Um, there wasn't a choice, um, but now cinemas are, are, are clean, and you know, so you know, you, you can smoke if you if it's a habit and if you need to smoke, um, if you find it pleasurable, but. Um, if you don't, then you, you don't have to be around that. Um, and we have a choice of what we put into our minds, you know, with mindfulness. If you're not mindful, the things come at us and we, we get infected with it. Like you know, any other illness, we get infected with it. And so uh, the mind is full of these uh, critical, negative ways of thinking about all kinds of things. Um, but with mindfulness, we don't have to. It's not that we don't care um, about 
the situation with the climate, with the planet. It's not that we don't care about um, the way that um, our society, our politicians, uh, can seem to have lost their way a little bit in regard to uh, some aspects of sila. Um, it's not that we don't care about situations of conflict that we hear about in the world, the awful sort of gun crimes, the and the, sort of the way that the legislation is that allows these things to happen. It's not that we don't care about them, but um, there can be a sense of concern without the outrage, the judging, the blaming, a sense of concern, a sense of compassion, um, a sense of wanting in some way to contribute, to, to help. Um, So learning to recognize the pollutants of the mind. And the five hindrances are very helpful um, sort of uh, template really for recognizing them. You know, greed or lust, negativity or ill will, dullness, which is just a blanking out of everything. You know, just can't cope, get me out of here kind of thing. Uh, the restlessness, agitation, worry, uh, which can sometimes seem like concern, but wor worry is a really difficult one. It gets under your skin. You know, how do you get rid of worry? Well, that's where we have to be really mindful. To just notice, notice what's going on. Find uh, strategies, find skills for working with it, and with doubt also. <clears throat> so living together in community is, is a wonderful opportunity uh, for uh, contemplating our sense of who we are, who we think we are. <laughs> uh, because we live together day after day, year in, year out, uh, and it's like living with a lot of mirrors, you know, noticing how we respond to each other. You know, this one we like, this one we're interested in, this one we admire, this one we're a little bit scared of, this one we're very critical of. Um, what's that saying about, about us? So see it like a mirror. What's it saying about us? Not about me as a fixed entity, but me as a constantly ever-changing uh, kind of mirage. Very interesting at Milntum, we have this, this is where I live, we have this lochen, which in English is like a pond. And uh, we also have beavers, which are these... Um, rodents, they're animals, they're kind of about this big with a, with a tail. Well, babies are about this big and then the, the parents can be about this big with a tail, so they're quite, they can be quite big. And uh, they come out uh, in the early evening, just, sort of just as the light is beginning to change. And they stay out all night, they, they like to eat trees. Um, <laughs> and because uh, they're out at night and because you don't actually often see them uh, and because they're, they're very lovely to watch. I spend quite a lot of time just sitting out in the evening time, um, often with a stick of incense because we also have midges and fortunately midges don't like incense so that's, you can sit more peacefully with incense than with midges and just watching the surface of the water. And there's interesting things about the surface of the water because when it's very, very still, you have these extraordinary reflections of the trees and of the sky and of the light as it changes. And I'm, I'm 
I've got very interested in that because it looks so real. You know, you just sit and you just look at this reflection. And it's really hard to believe that it's, it's just water. It's just, you know, it's just the water element. Because, you know, it, it, it's, it's there. You, um, there's this image. And uh, when it's still, it's just very clear. And then when the wind blows, it, it's less clear. It ripples and it becomes a bit distorted. And uh, I think it's a very good simile for, for our view of ourselves and of one another. You know, we take ourselves to be very real. I'm like this, and we can fix ourselves. This personality is like this. This is Sister Chandasiri, she's like this. She does this, and she's like this, and she can, she's good at this, and she's bad at this, and she made a complete mess of that. And that's how she is, that's all, you know, she's, she's the sort of, the kind of compilation of all of the things that she's ever done, all of her relationships, and family, and nursery school, and growing up. This is, this is what she is, and you know, Arjun Amra is like this, Arjun Sundra is like this, and each one of you, you, you all like like a fixed, solid thing, and then you you begin to contemplate it and look at it. You just realise it's actually not like that at all. This is a constantly shifting, changing, moving. Um, I love the line in the Buddha's words on loving kindness: "By not holding to fixed views." pure-hearted one having clarity of vision is not born again into this world or being freed from such society is it not born again into this world uh, not holding to fixed views just allowing it to just shift and change this one here and those ones out there So my encouragement would be to, to notice when you have clung to a fixed view, and when you are struggling with something, some person, some situation that seems as though it's never, ever, ever going to change. And just to consider the possibility that maybe it's not quite as fixed as you thought. I've been walking around Amarawati, well today particularly, but when I first got back a couple of days ago and looked where Metasom was. Metasom, this building that I've lived with for 35 years, was it 35, 40 years, since 1984 when we first came here. That was Metasom, this building, it was there. And people walked in and out of it, all kinds of things happened in it. And, there's just earth now. There's space and earth. And another building behind it. Change. And then going into Bodhi House. Looking at Bodhi House. This lovely kind of bijou accommodation that we made for uh, close friends of the, you know, special, special guests and people's relatives. And all these lovely things that we put in Bodhi has lovely curtains and carpets and things. It's just rather a pathetic kind of a pad. <laughs> you can imagine the squatters moving in. Uh, <laughs> it still has basins, it has loos. Light fixings, some. Everything disconnected. Going into the library. There's space. Going into the sala, and that was particularly touching because I remember the sala when we first came here, like the old dining room of the old school, which had probably, you know, been a very solid entity for the people living here at that time. And then, just looking at the sala, you know, just half the carpets from the floor gone, and the Buddha Rupa's not there anymore, and just walking around this shell that had seemed so solid, so fixed. 
and now it's empty, empty shell. And probably next time I come back, it won't be there at all. Something else. So things do change. Even the most fixed, solid parts of our lives change, they shift, they move. This world that we live in is constantly constantly moving, constantly changing. Not, not what we think it is. Like Lumpur is always talking about just consciousness. That, that's, that's, that's real, that's there. But everything else is just kind of like a shell, moving, changing. So in this monastery we have an opportunity to contemplate these things you know, in relation to our own lives and to gradually become aware of the, the clouds that obscure our vision and to consider the possibility of living like the moon, freed from clouds. You know, and in this way, to be able to make a real uh, contribution uh, to the world that we live in. Yeah. You know, some people will teach and talk to people and have a far-reaching influence. Other people will might not do that, might be more just living carefully, responsibly as best they can in this monastery or in other monasteries. Um, but each one of us can contribute in our own way. And that's a very wonderful thing. So I really celebrate this uh, opportunity today, this going forth of Sister Garawa, Sister Sobita, uh, into the uh, Silidara community, and really wish for them, each of them, that they may receive the support, the encouragement, the guidance, and that they may be able to really, I mean, that they'll be offered plenty of support and encouragement and guidance, but that they may be able to receive it and use it uh, in their lives uh, so that they may really um, experience the joy of liberation from every kind of suffering. And I wish the same for each one of us here today. So I'll end my um, little talk at this point. Thank you.